part of the, this council when you went to your Martin Luther King in Washington? No, well, I don't that know. That's, that I think that was 1963, and I went with a group of people from the International Ladies Garment Workers Union because they had a bus. And I was offered um, a seat on it by the head of the local union and uh, went down. It was uh, really quite an inspiring thing to see that mall completely filled with people who were basically <coughs> assembling to let the national government know that uh, civil rights <coughs> needed to be supported. I mean, I'd like to know what some of your recollections were about the event in terms of the people around you, what the mood was, uh, what are your recollections of having people get food brought in, or even just the logistics of it. What, what well, are some it was, of your recollections? It was really amazing, and I don't know um, uh, about the organization of it, how they managed to have it go off so smoothly. I think that many people in the country who knew it was happening were very afraid that it would turn violent and that the police would attack. Um, I was, as I told you, with this group of lady, ladies garment workers union people. And we had box lunches and suppers on the bus, so we didn't, we didn't uh, get hungry at all. Um, I remember that it was a lovely day. It was uh, it was warm, and I can remember standing sort of off the side of, of things, not far from the, um, I guess it was the Jefferson Memorial, where the speakers were, and that there were trees, and it was nice to be in the shade. The mood was just astounding that all these people would come together and be so friendly and nice with each other and basically happy to be there, happy to see that they were part of an enormous movement. There were a number of speakers. Martin Luther King was, of course, the most uh, famous, and his speech is going to always be remembered. At some point, I went with other members of our group, sort of closer and out into the middle in front of the podium, and there was a little moment of panic because people were pressing forward. The head of the Garment Workers Union, whose name was Marty Moran, took hold of somebody's hand, and everybody joined hands, and he basically sort of pulled us catty corner through to the other side, where we wouldn't be in the middle of things, because there was just a, a possibility that with the crowd pushing forward, it could it could have become um, um, too much, and people would be killed in the crush. But that did not happen. And um, when it was all over, somehow they got the buses into where we were again, and we got on our bus and went home. I thought it was interesting that on the way down, Marty Moran talked to the people on the bus pretty much about why they were going and why it was a good thing for seamstresses to be supporting this movement. And he explained it pretty much in economic terms. Sewing jobs were moving south, and the south uh, had cheaper wages because they didn't have unions. Southern and, U.S., not South. As oh, Mexico. yes, Southern U.S., I'm Southern, Southern States. And so manufacturers would move their operations to the South where they could pay people less, and then people in the North would lose their jobs. 
And that, plus the fact that probably they were being um, paid to take this day off and be fed and get to go to Washington, <laughs> D.C. So I guess, but presumably with the economic train of thought, that, it, that if you supported civil rights, that the blacks would, would Then they not would get, they would rise and they would demand unions and their wages would go up and, okay, yes, I didn't make that clear. In any case, on the way back, after this huge day, Marty Moran again addressed the people, but this time he just asked them questions about what did they see and how did they feel about it. And it was just so amazing to me that the women who had before um, been receptive to the idea of going for other reasons were describing almost cheerfully sometimes the joy that they had felt seeing black people and white people together as friends and um, they just described it in emotional terms as a very very wonderful experience where were the majority of them white yes i would say all of them and, and not from affluent or educated families get a sense that during the speech that what you were listening to would be a pivotal part of the, the civil rights movement. In other words, this was bringing it to a national stage from which the government might actually respond or have a positive way. I was glad to be part of it, but I don't think I sensed that it would be as important as it turned out to be. I was amazed when I saw the numbers of people coming up that way. I was even more amazed when I saw all of the TV coverage, and I am still appreciative of seeing, usually around Martin Luther King's birthday, reprints of that speech still being printed. Well, they were pretty heady times. I mean, a lot of different things were very high energy, although maybe not on that scale. You had like the weathermen bombing things in the U.S. You had the war itself going on. I mean, it may have been that the, the scale of that event was, was maybe... Oh, absolutely. Um, and let's, let's not forget the sexual revolution and the uh, interest in psychoactive drugs the war and the civil rights movement all together at the same time. And when Kennedy was assassinated and we realized that the president would now be Lyndon Johnson, a senator for, a, well, he was vice president by that time, but he had started out as a senator from Texas and a um, southerner which would be construed to mean anti-civil rights. Um, so it was not only grief at Kennedy's death, but dismay that Johnson would now be president. And it was amazing to see how things actually went. The Civil Rights Act came into being. Results of all of that come into play in terms of the quality of life for African Americans in the Harrisburg area. Or was it more gradual that you could say that there was some period after 69, maybe over a five year period, a 10 year period? All right. I was trying to think for a second of another big thing that Johnson accomplished, oh, okay. and that was the war on poverty, which was yeah. closely related to civil rights, but I saw not s startling changes, but little changes in many, many places. Um, it became illegal to 
to discriminate against people in housing and employment and other public services such as restaurants. And it was followed up with things such as somebody who was responsible for a whole department in the, in the state of Pennsylvania for finding and hiring qualified black people to fill positions that were more middle and upper class positions. Um, the same thing happened with the schools. It was uh, people would go and actively seek candidates from um, black colleges and try to persuade them to come and teach in Harrisburg. Um, you began to see black people where you hadn't seen them before. For example, behind the counter as a clerk in a department store downtown, which was unheard of 10 years before. They were pointing out that you've been allowed into the customer. Well, I don't know. You know, uh, the green uh, that is in, in money was always the bottom line for most people in business. They could un overcome a lot of prejudice if it paid, uh, paid them to do so. Um, but sometimes given very inferior service, uh, and I have seen since the um, civil rights movement uh, terrific growth in middle class blacks of being able to live in the suburbs and send their children to good schools. And it's a very different world now from what it was then. Not that I think that all prejudice or discrimination has been eliminated far from it, but at least people don't speak openly um, their racist thoughts, and they are pretty effectively prohibited from um, acting out um, their uh, prejudices in the public sector.